60 Minutes advises that the following story contains explicit sexual accounts and graphic language that may disturb some viewers. Parental guidance is recommended. It's hard to imagine a graver charge. It's against one of the most powerful men in Australia, the man who is now the Catholic Archbishop of Sydney. Now, the accusation is simply this, that 10 years ago, Dr. George Pell attempted to bribe a distressed young man who had been sexually assaulted by a priest, and that Dr. Pell did this to cover up a potential scandal to protect his church. And, as you'll see, there's more. Money offered to silence the family of two young girls, other tragic victims of a predator in the Catholic Church. David Ridsdale grew up in Ballarat in country Victoria. He had been born into a strong Catholic family. He was one of nine children. His uncle, Gerald Ridsdale, was a priest. When I grew up, he was always like the shining light, and the, uh, certainly for my grandmother, he was the pinnacle of her Catholic achievement, I guess. He started to hang around more when I reached around the age of 11. He started to turn up, and my mum was pregnant with my youngest sister, and he started to offer to assist by looking after me for weekends or taking me away. Father Gerald was hanging around because he was a pedophile. Father Gerald began assaulting David when David was 11 and the abuse lasted till he was 15. What forms did the assaults take? There was always Inici masturbation no, of you? No, no, initially it was masturbation, then it was kissing, um, and then oral sex, um, both. And I remember the first time we were in the bush somewhere and he tried to make me perform oral sex and I remember gag. I was gagging and stuff and he would get angry if I couldn't perform the way he wanted and he took me for driving lessons that was the key did you want to learn to drive let me drive a car in a paddock and sure any 11 year old will tell you that's a pretty exciting thing sick as it may sound the abuse would sometimes occur when priest was driving altar boy to the next town to say mass both as a man as a priest, he knew it was wrong. And what would be his demeanour? Um, at the time, a total blank. It wasn't. It was, you know, it was no words, no anything. It was an action, and then it would finish, and he would just drive on as if nothing had happened. And then we. Do you mean that he'd then, yeah, start the car? He'd start the car and go straight to the the church and say mass. And there. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Well, it's, it's hard to forget. He was probably the most notorious pedophile. He was shift from parish to parish. Whenever the church authorities were told of what he was up to, they seemed to just ignore it and uh, send him on the, his merry way to another parish and not uh, warn the parishioners. David Forster is a Melbourne lawyer who has represented nearly 100 victims of sexual abuse. He says Gerald Ridsdale had been abusing children for 15 years prior to latching on to David. Isn't someone culpable in circumstances like that? Someone's got to take responsibility for that sort of thing. Well, you'd hope that someone would take responsibility, but the fact is there is a complete lack of accountability for the, for this um, the the disastrous way the church has um, treated victims of sexual abuse. Another young priest who figured in David's childhood was George Pell. Pell is now Archbishop in Sydney. This is where you'd see Pell quite a bit. Often, yeah, he would swim laps here and he was a big man and kids would come and sort of, he was the man mountain, you'd jump on and he'd throw you off. And... He would have known my parents since before I was born. Um, so it was a family relationship? Yeah, I mean, he didn't come round to the family or anything, but you'd see him at functions. I mean, I'd see him in the pool, I saw him quite a lot. And I've called him George from when I was a kid. I've never called him father, I never have, it's never... Father George? But no, never. No, he's George to me, he always was. And he knew you, David? Oh, there you yeah, go, he David. knew I was, yeah, yeah, definitely. And would greet me by name. And, uh... Pell also knew well Uncle Gerald, 
David's abuser. They'd been to school together, seminary together, and as young priests, they'd shared a house. In the early 90s, David summoned the courage to tell the now Bishop George Pell what Father Ridsdale had done to him. He was one of the few individuals that I trusted as a young man that I could think back on all the people I knew in the Catholic Church. And he's one of the few individuals that I thought I had a good rapport with and a trust relationship and a friendship. I knew he was the bishop in the area because through my work and suddenly realised that he was in a position of power within the church. And I honestly thought I would find a way to deal with my own emotional problems without having to tell the world what had happened. And my big fear, the reason I hadn't gone earlier, was actually my grandparents, especially my grandmother, who, you know, I loved to bits. And I was terrified that if she found out, it would kill her. This is your grandmother, who it's is Gerald's, the mother of Gerald, yeah. Father Gerald Ridster. Yeah. Okay. I was terrified. And so eventually, I chose a course of action. Okay. Now, you called Bishop Pell yeah. out of the blue. Yeah. Tell me why, please. I was getting so confused and so psychologically um, agitated and depressed and angry. I had to deal with this issue. I, and I believed at the time that he was the best way for me to go, look, what help do you have? I actually, I think my terms were, what internal processes do the church have to help with situations like this because I'm beside myself and I'm terrified. Now, to the best of your memory, tell me what happened, please. You dialed up a number and then what? I dialed number, asked to speak to him. I said, hello, George, because that's what I call him. And he said, you know, hi, how are you? I said, look, this assault has happened to me. Um, I'm really beside myself. I need some assistance, some help. His reaction was so totally unexpected from he didn't respond to anything I said. He sort of cut me off and um, was using all sorts of language and quite confusing. Now, did you tell him specifically? I told him specifically I'd been assaulted by my uncle, Gerald Ridstar. Very specifically. Okay. Uh, and what did he say? He took control of the conversation and I could sense anger. I didn't, I, I, and that, at that point, I can categorically say I don't remember everything he said because it was overwhelming. It was very confusing and... I started to get a sense he was insinuating things, and I felt like I'd done something wrong. That you'd done something wrong? Yep. That I was at fault, and that I was causing him grief. And then all of a sudden, I just stopped and went, George, I'm totally lost. Can you please tell me what you were trying to say here? And his response to that was, I want to know what it will take to keep you quiet. Now, are there any doubts in your mind that those were the specific words that he used? Um, I want to know what it would take to keep me quiet. None at all. Not those last two phrases, no. Because it triggered... Ten years after the event, how can you be so sure? Because of what it triggered in me. It changed everything. Um, all of a sudden, the priorities got into place. My fear of my grandma had to be put aside. Despite the fact that this day I still believe that by becoming open with it, it actually did kill her. She became very ill not long after. It came out and was soon bedridden and died. Do you realise the gravity of what you're saying? I mean, 10 years after the event, you're saying that the man that's now the Archbishop of Sydney, effectively the head of the Catholic Church in Australia, 10 years ago, was offering to shut you up about child sexual abuse. Yeah. You can't make a much more grave charge than that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that is definitely what happened. You know, that was because he, that one phone conversation is the reason that I then went to the police and so on and everything that okay. happened afterwards. Okay, so continue with the phone conversation. You then put the direct question, what are you trying to say, or words to that effect? Yeah. And what was the response? It was very definite. I want to know what it will take to keep you quiet. And you then said what? You probably have to beep it, but I said, fuck you and fuck everything you stand for. And, and I then? hung up. And any, any minuscule faith I might have had in the church and its people <laughs> was exploded. David says he then rang his elder sister, Bernie. David rang me uh, one, I think it was afternoon, and uh, 
was very distraught when he rang and said that he had, had a, a, made a phone call to um, George Pell and asked him for his advice relating to um, sexual abuse by my uncle uh, that David had suffered as a child and that the outcome of the conversation was that George had asked him what it would take for it to go away, to make it go away. How long after the conversation between David and Pell did David call you? The same day. David told me he also reported the conversation to a second sister, Trish. David told me that after he had told George about the abuse, George asked him what it would take uh, to keep him silent. In fact, David's words to me were, the bastard tried to offer me a bribe. That same day, David says he rang the police. I told them I wanted to press charges against my uncle. Did you tell them about the conversation with Pell? I can't really remember. I don't, I was just, I was actually in tears talking to them and it was when I mentioned my uncle's name that everything changed all of a sudden. Unbeknownst to David, at that same time, Victorian police were already investigating Father Gerald Ridsdale. The day after David made his statement, Ridsdale was charged over the sexual assault of David and a number of other boys. When he appeared in court in May 1993, George Pell was by his side. Ridsdale eventually did three months. Tell me the time frame. At that stage, had your conversation with Pell taken place? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, months before. So at the time he's walking into the court... He was fully aware of what I'd said to him. He was fully aware of what the man alongside him had done to you, or anyway, your well, account. I'd told him, yeah, absolutely. Fully aware. Not that long after these events, Father Ridsdale faced even more serious charges and was eventually sentenced to a minimum of 15 years. Stephen Woods was another victim of Ridsdale and two Christian brother teachers. Well, I was first abused by Brother Best. He was the principal of St. Olympia's Primary School. And then the next year, I went to St. Pat's College and where I was abused by Brother Dowlin. Uh, I went to the cathedral one day to the presbytery and, and looking for a priest to talk to after you know, two years of being molested. And um, uh, the priest who answered the door said, oh, yes, there's a Father Ridsdale here. So I knew him from long connections ago. And lo and behold, within a short while, I was being raped by him. When you say short while, what do you mean? Well, within the hour. Within the hour? Yes. Now, the other two Christian brothers who molested you, what is their connection to Pell, as you understand it? Well, Pell was the vicar general looking after religious education in Ballarat. And as Dowlin was moved to St. Pat's College here, uh, st st straight after molesting a boy at, in Melbourne, uh, Pell should have known. He damn well should have known. I mean, how incompetent could he have to be? That's his responsibility. He should have known what was going on in, in his school that he, was, that he was supposed to be in charge of. It's a matter of regret that the Catholic Church has taken some time to come to grips with this sexual assault issue um, adequately. As Archbishop of Melbourne in 1996, Pell established a diocesan commission into sexual abuse. I would like to make a sincere, unreserved and public apology Pell's process, as it is known, was designed to keep cases out of court. Compensation payouts were capped at $50,000. It would appear to be a maximum based on protection of the church rather than protection of the, the victim. I feel as though we've been told to take the $50,000 and shut up. It, sounds like, it feels like the same thing. These parents, whom we'll call Gary and Elizabeth, have asked us not to identify them or their daughters. Over a six-year period, two of their three girls were sexually abused by their local priest, Father Kevin O'Donnell. The abuse began in 1987, but church officials received their first complaint about O'Donnell as far back as 1958. At the time of their daughter's abuse, the auxiliary bishop was George Pell. I mean, it's I his duty to know, isn't it? He was a very senior part of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. 
He was the bishop for the area in which we reside. He should have known. The two girls were each five years old when the abuse started. In the years since, the eldest has attempted suicide several times. The very night before our interview with her parents, she attempted an overdose. Her sister, according to the parents, started drinking to numb the pain, wandered in front of a car and is now confined to a wheelchair. Is there any doubt in your mind that there's a direct connection between the abuse your daughters suffered and their present state? Absolutely not. There's, it's a direct connection. There's no doubt. Gary and Elizabeth applied for compensation through the commission established by Pell. For the eldest daughter, they were offered $50,000. In this letter from George Pell's lawyers, they were told the compensation offered provided a realistic alternative to litigation that will otherwise be strenuously defended. $50,000 for a destroyed daughter's life? Absolutely. Was that reasonable? I, be I don't believe so. So their position was that no matter what had been done to your daughter, $50,000 was the ceiling? That's right, even if she'd been abused by 10 priests. Have you signed on the bottom line? Our daughter hasn't, no. Father Kevin O'Donnell died in 1997, shortly after being released from jail. In February of that year, Archbishop Pell travelled to the Melbourne parish where O'Donnell had abused children for 17 years. Pell granted Gary and Elizabeth an audience. Well, we'd gone into that meeting, I think, hoping to get some answers as to how the church felt about it, how Pell felt, felt about it, and really looking for a, an expression of great sorrow and an open arms of, what can we do to help you? Instead, we were confronted with a, a legalistic approach from someone just trying to manage the problem, trying to maybe dispose of us in a, a short 15 minute meeting and that would be it. We came away from the meeting after discussions with him feeling empty and angry. We had, there was nothing came out of that meeting that made us feel as though the church or the hierarchy was really helping us or other people to come to terms with what had happened and to get through that, that whole process of recovery. It was a, just an awful feeling. Mm. Came out feeling worse than when we went in. Mm. Yeah, we showed Pell a photo of him presenting our daughter with a conf confirmation certificate at her confirmation. Uh, his response was, that's a very nice photo, very, that's lovely. As if to say that's how, how we want the children coming out of the church. We then showed him a photo of our daughter just after she had cut her wrists with blood coming out of them. And his only comment with absolutely no change in, in attitude, in facial expression was, oh, she's changed, hasn't she? And there was just, that was it. That was it. I was nearly crying. My wife was nearly crying. He sat there with a stony face. Oh, she's changed. And she's certainly changed. Mm. There's no doubt he was right. And she'd changed because of the actions of a priest years before. The actions of a priest who, whose actions had been known previously in other parishes and he'd been moved on. people are too afraid. They don't have the courage and I want to see people have courage and people like George Pell are in the position to change that and you know he, what he did to me was wrong. Simple as that. He reacted like someone who was in damage control land already. Um, <laughs> I don't know what was going on before I rang but he was in damage control the minute I rang, he knows, and I would sit and look him in the eye right now, 
and, uh, and say, I dare you to lie to my face. I dare you. So why should we believe you? George Pell knows the truth. George Pell in a moment. As you've just heard tonight, a grave allegation against the Archbishop of Sydney, Dr. George Pell. It was alleged that Dr. Pell sought to buy the silence of a distressed young man who had been sexually assaulted by a priest. Here now is Dr. Pell's response. Archbishop, how widespread, if at all, would you consider sexual abuse by Catholic clergy to be here in Australia now? Um, I think we have brought to light most of it. For the last uh, five or six years, we've had a system of protocols in place, mm. which I believe is substantially working. There's much too much of it. I've apologized and I repeat uh, my apology to the, uh, to the victims, but uh, we're dealing with it. Uh, uh, you seem to be conceding though that it is still going on. Well, human nature doesn't uh, change. I hope that there's not uh, too much of it uh, going on. Uh, so you can see that some is probably going on? I don't really know. Anything that's brought to my attention, uh, I will see that it's dealt with according to the protocols. There shouldn't be any? There shouldn't be any, certainly now, not. Now, if it was going on now, would you necessarily know about it? Not necessarily, no. Now, is it homosexual sex or heterosexual sex amongst the clergy that's the bigger problem? Most uh, pedophilia uh, involves young girls. With the Catholic clergy, more of it uh, involves uh, younger men after puberty. Can you put a number, I mean out of the air, on the number of Catholic clergy who have been convicted of these sort of crimes, say, over the last 10 years? Uh, no, I can't. I can give you um, Melbourne figures, though. During my uh, time uh, in uh, Melbourne, we paid compensation to 100 victims yeah. and 15 or 20 priests were stood down. Do you know this Broken Rights Group? I do. They've put out a list here of uh, 99 convictions, not all priests, mm -hmm. some brothers, mm -hmm. but you know, Catholic uh, uh, employees, I suppose, mm -hmm. to use the broad sweep, uh, 99 in 10 years. That's about one a month. Uh, that's probably right. It's a, it's a sad and terrible thing. It's probably right. I'm not sure, but it's probably of that order. Still today, one a month? No, certainly not. I don't think... Uh, I think... I'm hoping that the worst is behind us. Now, when you were Episcopal Vicar for Education in Ballarat, uh -huh. that's effectively the boss of the Catholic teachers? T uh, titular, titular. The yeah. bishop's representative in the area. Well, buck stops with you. No, not really. The buck stops with either the bishop or the director of education. I chaired the education board. Very much a part-time job. So I was involved, certainly. Yeah, I want to know how much responsibility you take personally mm -hmm. for those teachers under you in mm -hmm. those 10 years that you were there mm -hmm. who abused their charges. Uh, I, I wouldn't take any direct responsibility at all because I was not aware of uh, any accusations that uh, I, I didn't deal with. No, but wasn't it your job to know what was going on? Uh, well, no, because I wasn't the executive running uh, education. Uh, Bishop, isn't that ducking the responsibility? No, it's a description of what in fact happened. Yeah, but what should have happened is really what I'm trying to get to. Well, what should have happened uh, is uh, uh, another problem. I, I don't apologise for any of the... I do apologise. I don't want to uh, uh, pretend that uh, those things were always handled well, but it wasn't my bag. I was responsible for one area of church life and I fulfilled my responsibilities. I didn't, in the areas where I didn't have responsibilities, I, uh, uh, I wasn't obliged to act. Tell me, you know Father Gerald Ridsdale? I certainly do. Did you go to school with him? Uh, he was years, uh, years ahead of me. At uh, the same school? But we were at the same school. I knew him as a seminarian. Uh, knew of him as a seminarian, knew him as a priest, and for 12 months only, I was in the same um, uh, house as him. You shared a house with him? With, uh, uh, there were four priests uh, there. So you got to know him pretty well in that time? Moderately. Now, I presume you didn't know at that time that he was a heinous pedophile? I had no idea at all. Never could, entered my head. How could you not know? 
after going to school with him, going to seminary with him, growing nobody, up with him, nobody, living with him. Nobody around there knew, knew that. Nobody even hinted it to me. Had no idea. He survived in that role for years and years. He's, he's a clever fellow. And he did some dreadful evil things. And how could you not know? I, I certainly didn't. And none of the priests around me knew either. Did you know David Ridsdale, Father Gerald Ridsdale's nephew? Yes, I know, uh, I know the, the, the Ridsdales, yes. Did David Ridsdale tell you that his uncle, Gerald, Father Gerald, had been abusing him? Never. Never. Never? At any stage. So he says he did? Well, that's completely false. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. He says that in January 93, he rang you and told you. Oh, well, uh, that's 93. I thought you were talking about back in the 70s. Uh, I, uh, Ridsdale would have been in jail by then, I think. Mm. He went to jail in 93, sir. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly, I've spoken I've, uh, with David off and on over the years. I've got on fairly well with him. Right. David says that he called you in January 93 and told you about it. Well, that's, that's probably true. Uh, but I was well aware of, uh, of uh, Ridsdale's crimes in general by 93. And that when he rang you in January 93, you offered him a bribe to shut up? I certainly offered nothing of the sort. Could I play you the tape, sir, of his accusations? Yeah, for sure. Please. Then all of a sudden, I just stopped and went, George, I'm totally lost. Can you please tell me what you were trying to say here? And his response to that was, I want to know what it will take to keep you quiet. Now, are there any doubts in your mind that those were the specific words that he used? Um, I want to know what it will take to keep you quiet. None at all. And you then said what? Uh, you probably have to beep it, but I said, fuck you and fuck everything you stand for. And, and I then? hung up. Now, Archbishop, those words there are, uh, are mm. terrible. Did mm. you use those words, I want to know what it would take to keep you quiet? No, I didn't. I've got a recollection that I spoke to David uh, a number of times, uh, that he phoned me a number of times uh, on this, uh, 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 on this uh, incident. Uh, I think by that stage Ridsdale was in jail. No. He wasn't in jail in 93? No, he was in jail later in 93. We can date this, you see, because you have the police statement yes, that yes. David Ridsdale gave, yes. which is purportedly on the same day that he spoke to you on the phone. Uh, uh. Well, I can't ever remember him swearing at me. I have... Uh, I, uh, well, leave aside the swearing, sir. The, the really important words are, you said, so it is alleged, uh, I want to know what it would take to keep you quiet. No, I certainly would never have said that, and I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. I could quite imagine saying to him uh, what sort of uh, help might uh, we be able to offer him in terms of... Uh, I mean, I'm enormously sympathetic mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, his plight. And uh, in 93, as an auxiliary bishop uh, in Melbourne, I had no capacity to, to uh, offer him anything anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I certainly... Uh, um, now, I, I quite... Uh, quite prepared to concede that I would have been rattled, uh, that uh, I was distressed. Uh, I have uh, uh, great sympathy towards him and, and uh, his family, and what happened to him was uh, dreadful. But his his recollection is uh, of, of some of the things he said is totally wrong. Uh, it would be very serious if uh, if you had said that. It, yeah, I certainly would uh, be. A resigning matter. I I, well, I don't know about resigning, but certainly be serious and a, gra and a grave error. Okay. I'd like you to play, play you now, sir, a tape of uh, David Ridsdale's two sisters who have been interviewed for this program. David told me that after he had told George uh, about the abuse, George asked him what it would take uh, to keep him silent. In fact, David's words to me were, the bastard tried to offer me a bribe. So having heard the sisters, sir, do you uh, have anything you'd like to add? They were misinformed. Right. But, it, I mean, it's a, it's a very... Uh, it's a very distressing uh, sort of situation uh, for, for David and uh, both for myself uh, uh, at the time. Yes. I have a recollection that he spoke to me more than once 
And I think I phoned subsequently uh, at least once uh, to his house and spoke to his, uh, spoke to his wife to see how things were going. Right. I spoke with him a number of times. Right. And I, uh, I deeply regret that he misunderstood things in these ways. And before today, I'd never heard a suggestion that he'd put that interpretation on it. He'd never said that to me. Do you oh, know of the thanks. family in, uh, uh, in Victoria, Melbourne? Two daughters? Uh, I've met once with the parents. Their daughters were abused by Father uh, Kevin O'Donnell from 87 to 92. Mm -hmm. And the families of the opinion that if you'd done your job, their, their daughters would not have been abused. Oh, well, that's a completely uh, mistaken. Would you like to see what they've said, sir? Yes, yes. Please. We showed Pell a photo of him presenting our daughter with a conf confirmation certificate at her confirmation. Uh, his response was, that's a very nice photo. We then showed him a photo of our daughter just after she had cut her wrists with blood coming out of them. And his only comment, with absolutely no change in in attitude, in facial expression, was, oh, she's changed, hasn't she? They're not a very happy family, are they, Archbishop? No, no, they've um, they've suffered a lot. Here are those photos that he was talking about. Yeah, good. Probably I've, seen. I've, I've uh, which is the... That's the one, I think, of you confirming the last. Yes. And the other one is uh, later. I, I've never seen the photo... Uh, with a uh, slashed wrist? With a slashed wrist. Mother and father say they gave it to you. Well, uh, I don't believe I've seen. I've got no recollection of that. I mean, it's an awful... Uh, no, I, I don't believe I ever saw that. And you offered them $50,000 to offered shut up? Them, I offered them nothing. Huh? Uh, they uh, they were free to go into a uh, into a, a process which is run by an independent uh, panel. I've got the letter here. That's uh, from the lawyers after they'd been uh, through the process which they were free so to you, enter. You're exactly right. So it's, it's from the lawyers. Cause Chambers Westgarth. That's right. Dear Mr and Mrs, I won't mention the family name. Mm -hmm. As you know, we act for Archbishop Pell. Yeah. You offered them 50 grand yeah. to be quiet. Uh, I, I offered them 50 grand in uh, compensation according to publi the publicly acknowledged procedures. And to be quiet. That, uh, and they chose not to accept that. <laughs> we, the words have, if words have meaning, so you bought their silence, or you sought to buy their silence, a realistic alternative to litigation that will otherwise be strenuously defended. Uh, that's, if, if uh, yes, if they want to go to uh, uh, to law, we will use the law to defend ourselves. And, and, you, and you swear them to secrecy. Well, we ask them to keep. Uh, you swear them. Don't ask them. You swear them. Uh, th there is a, uh, a requirement that they don't talk about it, and most of them are happy not to. And if they don't want to use that, they can do something else. They can go to the courts? Yes. Yeah, why do you impose this condition, sir? Uh, because uh, many of them don't want uh, uh, to be subjected to publicity, and of course it's shameful for the church. Archbishop, thank you. Good. Thank you. Good. Well, that was very good. <laughs> Sixty Minutes advises that the following story contains explicit sexual accounts that may disturb some viewers. Parental guidance is recommended. There's no way you could have missed the reaction to last week's story on paedophilia in the Catholic Church. Last week we broadcast the allegation that Archbishop Pell offered a bribe to keep quiet an episode of child sexual abuse. Well, the Archbishop denied that allegation. Tonight, you'll hear from a man who was a priest for 24 years and says it beggars belief that Archbishop Pell was unaware of the child sexual abuse occurring within his church. And tonight, we accuse the church of paying hush money, this time to a victim repeatedly raped by a Christian brother. Just last year, the victim was paid $50,000 to shut up about the crime. Jeff Fitzpatrick has had a troubled life. 
A rebellious child with alcoholic parents, he was made a ward of the state and sent to a Catholic orphanage when he was 11. Those years changed him forever. I was there from 69 to 71. Okay. In that time, how frequently were you sexually abused? I was sexually abused, raped 14 times. I was uh, physically abused on uh, more than 30 or 40 occasions. Who performed the rapes upon you? Brother William Houston. How long had you been at the orphanage when the first time Brother Houston raped you? Three days. How many days? Three. Did you try to tell anybody about those rapes and what happened? Yes, I did. And uh, I was told I was a liar. I was told I was a troublemaker. And I was made to put my hand on his desk with my hand spread out like that, palms down, and I was given 10 buildings of a strap. It wasn't until 1996 that Jeff finally came forward and reported the abuse to the police. The brother was charged, but the charges were later dropped. Notwithstanding the charges not going ahead, what happened in April last year, just 14 months ago? My lawyers from, from Morty Alec got in touch with the uh, Towards Healings program and uh, arranged a mediation between the church and myself. And the result of that mediation, they offered me $50,000 um, to sign a document to not go ahead with it and not say anything more about this, what happened to me as a child. Did they walk in and say, here's $50,000 or what? Not straight off, no. No, they offered me 20000 And I, I laughed at them, literally. You've got a copy of the agreement there. Would you read Clause G to me, please? The church do not admit any wrongdoing has been committed. So they didn't admit, but they paid you 50000 That's right. Have you got the 50000 Yes. It's been paid to you? Yes. Now, I will read to you Clause K. It is a condition of the settlement that you... As a condition of the payment, the church required Jeff to swear that he would not make any comment or any communication of any type to any person in relation to these matters. That he would not publish any writing relating to any incident and that he would not make any comment in relation to any matters or any relevant incidents. That is, they gagged him. So you realise you're breaking that, uh, that agreement by talking to me now? Well, I'll give the church 40 cents and they can ring somebody who cares. <laughs> clearly, I don't care. I mean, clearly, the, uh, I just want to show what cover-up the church are doing. I mean, it's not only myself that's suffering. That Many victims like Jeff have come forward since last Sunday when allegations were made on this program against Sydney Archbishop George Pell. Now, did you tell him specifically? I told him specifically I'd been assaulted by my uncle, Gerald Ridsdale. Very specifically. Last week, David Ridsdale alleged that in February 1993, he went to Pell, then a Melbourne bishop, to tell him of the abuse he had suffered at the hands of his uncle, Father Gerald Ridsdale. I said, look, this assault has happened to me. Um, I'm really beside myself. I need some assistance, some help. And his response to that was, I want to know what it will take to, to keep me quiet. Now, are there any doubts in your mind that those were the specific words that he used? Um, I want to know what it would take to keep me quiet. None at all. Not those last two phrases, no. Because it triggered... Ten years after the event, how can you be so sure? Because of what it triggered in me. It changed everything. We can date this, you see... Archbishop the Pell police. denied yeah, these allegations. Now, I'm I quite, uh, quite prepared to concede that I would have been rattled, uh, that uh, I was distressed, uh, I... Uh, great sympathy towards him and, and uh, his family and what happened to him was uh, dreadful but his his recollection is uh, of, of some of the things he said is totally wrong in this statutory declaration dr pell claimed it was implausible that he would try to silence david because at the time i received the call from david allegations of misconduct against gerald ridsdale were already in the public domain 
But that is not how the investigating police remember it. So when did this matter come into the public domain, from your knowledge? Well, my interpretation of the, the two words public domain would suggest that, uh, that it would have been in the media, and uh, the first time that it was in the media was on the 5th. Of February 1993? Correct. The day, the day after Gerald Ridsday was first interviewed and charged by the police. And after the time that David Ridsdale claims, he, uh, Pell said to him, what will it take to uh, keep you quiet? Correct. Ray Steiger and Lisa McKenzie are the police officers who headed the first investigation into Father Gerald Ridsdale. During their investigation, they sought the cooperation of the Catholic Church and it was not always forthcoming such as on the day they had an appointment with the Bishop of Ballarat, the man responsible for moving Ridsdale from parish to parish. Our understanding was when we drove from Melbourne to Ballarat was that we were to have a meeting with Bishop Mulkerns. Now, do you know why he didn't show up? No. And the Bishop knew you were making inquiries about Gerald Ridsdale? Yes. In fact, it was my recollection that he was actually there, but that he he wasn't able to see us. Well, he was too time. busy. Well. <laughs> what they received that day was a typed list of the parishes Ridsdale had been moved to and from. Now, this is a list of uh, where Gerald Ridsdale was appointed. Yes. Apart from that, were they otherwise cooperative or not? Um, oh, Father, Murphy, uh, Father Murphy was the gentleman that we saw, and uh, he. He answered the questions um, that we asked, but uh, certainly um, that didn't provide any additional, additional uh, information. assistance. No, they, co they probably cooperated to the extent that they had to. Now that's pretty damning, isn't it? Well, certainly, uh, with other investigations that we were conducting at the time, there were other organisations that were somewhat more cooperative. Would you say? That's right. Yeah. In February 93, Lisa McKenzie and Ray Steiger charged Gerald Ridsdale with indecently assaulting 11 boys. He got three months. Later, he was jailed for 15 years for other abuses dating back to 1961. When Ridsdale was moved from uh, Ballarat north to Mildura, and then from Mildura to Swan Hill, and Swan Hill to Warnerville, Ballarat, East, Apollo Bay, now, did anyone give you the reason why he was being moved from place to place? No. Did you ask? Yes. And we what did they uh, say? We inquired uh, when we had that meeting, but uh, there wasn't really any explanation given as such. Uh, we were given the list and, and basically uh, not a lot of other additional information. From your inquiries, he offended at uh, most of these places here? It certainly, uh, it, it unfolded that way, yes. So you were certainly of the impression that he was moved on because the Catholic Church knew he was offending? That certainly was the opinion that we were getting. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's right. Yep. He, um, he only stayed like a short time in each town. In your experience, the Church would move the offender sideways as one approach and another approach, may I suggest, was to cover it up? I think that's a very fair analysis. Um, certainly it was, um, uh, transfer was what happened. Um, and cover up, um, I use the word that they had a strategy of denial and rejection. For 24 years, Phil O'Donnell was a Roman Catholic priest in Victoria. His is an insider's view of the church's inaction when faced with evidence of pedophiles within their ranks. It is horrifying to think of the number of young boys and girls who have been subsequently uh, abused because the strategy of the church was to deny uh, the reality. It was to turn against the victim, it was to blame the victim, it was to make uh, those supporting the victim uncomfortable, all of that stuff. O'Donnell first alerted the church hierarchy about a particular abusing priest back in 1978. I thought I had done the right thing by alerting the authorities because in my naivety or innocence I would have thought by alerting the authorities that action would happen. So what happened, he was moved sideways and that was his punishment. He got a different parish. Indeed. And went on doing the same thing, presumably. And convicted later. Why, why didn't you do something about it then? 
I kept, kept doing things. I've got on record um, numerous ta numerous uh, instances where I went to the proper authorities, wrote to them, spoke with them, and kept alerting them to the fact of, of how do they allow a priest with a known problem of sexually abusing against children to stay in active ministry. Um, it, it, it's not just one bishop who might not have handled something well. I, I have to say I think it was collective responsibility, which I say I'm part of the problem mm. quite clearly. Um, I should have done, should have gone to the police. There's no doubt about that. But there's some. You should have gone to the police, but you went to the bishop. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but but there is there was a collective responsibility. I think at this stage where the strategy just seemed to be, just put it off and see if it goes away. And of course, it just got put off and put off, and more kids got uh, abused. And um, when it got to about the early to mid nineties and the media exposure was horrific. Um, no longer could the issue be uh, covered up. And then I believe lots of very good things have happened. Uh, and I just think now um, if someone was abusing a kid uh, in a position of trust as a priest is, they wouldn't be doing it for long. It's a matter of regret that the Catholic Church has taken some time to come to grips with this sexual assault issue um, adequately. In 1996, George Pell, then Archbishop of Melbourne, established a panel to deal with sex abuse cases. The panel caps payouts at $50,000. It would appear to be a maximum based on protection of the church rather than protection of the, the victim. Gary and Elizabeth's two daughters were sexually abused by their local priest. They applied for compensation and have been offered $50,000 on account of their first daughter. They consider this money was offered to buy their silence. Pell's lawyers say the offer is a realistic alternative to litigation that will otherwise be strenuously defended. $50,000 for a destroyed daughter's life. Absolutely. Was that reasonable? I don't believe so. I feel as though we've been told to take the $50,000 and shut up. When victims still come forward today, the church is still applying the stratagem of running them through the courts, making yeah. it as difficult as possible. Yeah. When they try and, in a sense, take on the church, an individual's financial and legal resources compared to the, the might of the Catholic Church finance and legal, and our experience has been that so many victims have tried to run the litigation, the civil uh, matters, and have just been worn down under the weight of financial, legal uh, might of the opposing party, David Goliath. Mm. There's, um, and that's where, again, there's so much hurt with these people. At the time Gary and Elizabeth's daughters were being abused, the auxiliary bishop was George Pell. He was a very senior part of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. He was the bishop for the area in which we reside. He should have known. What's your opinion as to whether the likes of Archbishop Pell would have known this sort of thing was going on? I think anyone in authority would have known it was going on. Anyone who was a bishop in the Catholic Church through the 70s and 80s and 90s had to be aware of the volume of victims who were coming forward telling their stories. It beggars belief that anybody in a position of authority through the 70s, 80s and 90s was not aware of this as a very major crisis in the Catholic Church. The family of some of the victims have said to me that if the likes of Pell had done his job, then their daughters would not have been abused. Hmm. If Pell and let's name how many others do you want to name? Two days ago, I took Jeff Fitzpatrick to the Christian Brothers establishment where the Christian brother, he alleges, had repeatedly raped him still serves. Jeff wanted me to ask the brother for an apology. 
Brother Houston, how do you do? Richard Carlton is my name from 60 Minutes Television, sir. Excuse me. Could you tell me, do you, do you feel you have an apology to offer to, this, me? to this gentleman? Remember okay. St. Augustine's? Uh, 1969? No, 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 please, you please, remember? Please, 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 please. I do. Brother, thank you. Please leave the premises that you have been requested. What do you want from the church now? I want them to admit their fault. I want them to weed out the perpetrators that did these things to me. I want them to weed out the ones that are doing it to other victims as we speak. God only knows how many kids have been violated, how many kids have been abused. But in fairness to victims, I think it's time that people on the inside say, says their stories are true. They should be listened to, they should be believed. Uh, they shouldn't have to fight and continuously fight to prove uh, that these cases going over such a long period of time uh, are, are true. Dr Pell declined an invitation to reappear on the program tonight. Christian Brothers leader, Brother Peter Dowling, also declined to be interviewed. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.